All right. We're back. It is Comp 123. That's Programming 2 in the summer 2016 semester uh, here at Centennial. Uh, we're learning C-sharp. That's what we're learning. Um, and it's uh, week six, uh, part one of our broadcast. Last couple weeks, we've been doing um, object-oriented programming, which is, when you think about it, you know, not as easy as you, as it sounds, right? I mean, we started off with classes in week three, right? We hit a little bit of inheritance in week four. We've been kind of playing with inheritance a couple weeks. Week five, we were supposed to start talking about polymorphism, and we started doing that with the last day of classes. We Last week we had, we talked about this abstract class idea, right? So we'll talk about that a little bit more. And then we're going to talk about more abstract classes and interfaces here this week. Next week is our mid midterm, right? Just as a, I'm just looking at my folder structure here just to remind me. Um, next week is our midterm uh, when we look forward, right? So remember our midterm test is going to be held on the Friday, just to re recant when we're saying it again, right? It's just so in case some people are missing it or whatever. Friday at the same time we normally get together, that's 10.30, right? 10.30 to 12.30 on the Friday. It will be, you will have to build something, okay? It's not going to be a multiple choice true false midterm, right? You're going to have to use your C sharp. I might have to get you to download a, some kind of template, you know, so you don't start from scratch. And then you do something with it. You complete it or you do something, right? Now, those kinds of, of uh, midterms, the completion type, if I tell you to complete something, they're harder generally than if I say build it from scratch. Why is that? Just anyone have an idea? Well, you've already, it's yours, right? It's your code. If I get you to do, to figure, figure out my code, right? Now you're going to do two things. You're going to figure out what I want, look at my code, which is not your code, because you don't, you may, you don't program like me. I don't program like you. You don't program like him. You don't program like her, right? Everyone programs differently, right? Everyone codes differently. So you look at my code, even if I give you a template, you're going to go, oh God, right? So that's just that alone. That's number one. That's a, it's a hurdle. I'm just going to let you know about looking at somebody else's code is always a little bit more challenging because it's not your code. I'm going to try and make it as generic and the same as you've seen in class every single week. I'm not going to change anything. I'm not going to you know, surprise you with a new template you know, and say, here you go. You've never seen this before. Here you are. Right? Everything I'm going to talk about on the test right, is everything you've seen. Right? So it's not like you haven't seen it or we haven't touched it or we haven't talked about it because that would be just silly. Next week on the Tuesday, so a week today, we'll do a bit of a review just to help you with your test, all right? So I want to review all the topics and kind of hit um, any kind of questions you have about any sticky stuff that you guys have before the test because I want, I want to prepare you for the test. And, and that way, um, you know, there's nobody that's going to say, I didn't know, I, didn't, I couldn't understand, I don't remember. You know, those kind of things would be bad, right? So please, let's, on Tuesday, I know some people won't come because... You know, Tuesday's not a quiz class, and, you know, there's no lab next week, you know, as an example. But I would recommend, because it's a review day, come in, let's talk about stuff, and that way, you know, it'll make it easier for you, hopefully, for your test that comes on Friday. The truth is, though, either you know it or you don't, really, because the test will be open book, open internet, open everything. The only thing you can't do is talk to each other, right, and message each other. But you have access to full Google, whatever you want to do. Why? Because it won't help. That's why you'll have an hour and a half to build something, right? So you start Googling all over the place, it's not going to help you. It's going to actually slow you down, right? So you need to know. And the only way to know that is to practice, practice, practice. Keep doing your programs on your own. Make mess up, right? I want you to mess up a little bit. Have some trouble. Figure it out, right? Ask me some questions. Ask yourself some questions. And that way, you know, you, uh, you're a little bit, it becomes a little easier. Yeah. I want you to think about your test um, as if it's a small assignment, an in-house assignment. So the same kind of structure that you see in your assignments is the same structure you're going to get on your tests. Okay, I wasn't going to do this, but I might as well now since we're talking about assignments. Let me talk about assignment three. All right, I wasn't going to, but now that you brought it up, what the hell. Assignment three is up on uh, eCentennial, so it looks like this. Let's take a look. It's called Abstract Planets. Now, it's due week eight, which is, oh, this is wrong actually. This is 2016, right? Not, that means that you have to go back in time for this one. Um, I'll, I'll kind of save that one up. 
So uh, July 8th, 2016, not 2015. Um, it's actually worth 68 marks, not 67 marks. What happened? I think some, some of my changes didn't go through. Um, huh? Wonderful. So I'll fix it now. Let me just do this. So, uh, ba -ba -ba. Hold on a second. We'll print to PDF. Right, we'll just update it. If it's not up, that's perfect. That's fixed. I'll put it up now. <laughs> See, when we talk. Yeah, it makes it uh, better. That's what happens with these cra kind of crazy things, right? So we'll go to East Centennial. Uh, tom, Tom, Tom. Yo. Okay. Sorry about that. That is up on um, one, two, three. So under Dropbox, you'll see it as assignment number three, abstract plan. It's the rubric is there. Yes, I did put the rubrics there, and I I put I'm starting to put these rubrics in place again. This is kind of new for this semester. Um, I'm not required to do that. Like we're not required to put up a rubric or anything like that. But I want you to understand where you're getting marked, right? So that's the idea. So people ask, well, how am I getting marked for this? How how did you figure out what the hell? How do you figure out, um, you know, what, what this is worth or whatever? Well, this is where. I want you to kind of look at it and say, oh, okay, I get this. Right? I see where he's giving me a mark here and two marks there and three marks I lost there or whatever, right? So when you look at your rubric, as an example, it should tell you everything you need to know, right? So that way you know where, what, uh, um, how I'm, I'm, I'm distributing the marks, right? So we got quite a bit of a, of, you know, there's quite a bit of, uh, of, mar of, of assignments, and there's a couple of, uh, of assignments out there I got a mark still. Um, but at the end of the day, there shouldn't be any surprises. When you look at your assignment, you shouldn't go, where is this coming from, right? So if I was going to go back and look at the assignment details, take a look here. I've actually drawn out, shh, don't say anything to anybody. I'm not supposed to use these diagrams, you know, because people will get mad at me. But here's the diagram. <laughs> so what could you do with this diagram? I mean, I'm giving you the diagram, right? What could you do? Worst case scenario, you can copy it, right? You can copy the diagram, go into Visual Studio, and then from here, bam, you know, it, it, it kind of blots out, you know, pieces of your code ahead of time into separate files. Nothing's wrong with this. This is actually what happens in real life. In real life, we get a diagram like this. Here's what we want to say. Someone else has drawn, some architect has drawn it out or whatever. He's trying to figure out how it's going to relate one thing, relate to the other. And then what happens is we go in there and implement it. Take the diagram, and maybe we have to make some changes. Might be, there might be something that I missed or something, whatever. Go through and figure it out. So what is an abstract planet? Remember we talked about abstract classes. Classes that are abstract are not concrete. There's two types of classes. Concrete classes, hint, hint, it's going to be on your test. And abstract classes. Abstract classes, we never use abstract classes to create an object, right? We only create abstract classes as a blueprint for other classes. So remember, blue. Classes can be blueprints for objects, and classes can be blueprints for other classes. Right, that's what I want you to think of it. So think about this planet class. Planets have all planets. We can say have diameter, mass, some kind of moon count. Maybe they have moons. Maybe they don't. Right? Um, they have names. We name them. They have an orbital period. How long it takes for them to go around the, their their uh, parent star, whatever that is. Right? They might even have a ring count. They might have rings. Right? Some planets have both rings and moons, right? And they also have a rotational period. A rotation period is how often, how long it takes for the, the planet to rotate around itself, right? Rotational period, right? So orbital period, rotation period. So some statistics for planets. Okay, this is, by the way, uh, right from the internet. Like, you know, it's not like you're going to, if you go on the internet and find a planet, you'll see some of this, these stats for planets, right? So I've created properties like the same thing. Now, notice that there's only gets for diameter and mass. What kind of properties are those? Read-only properties, right? There's only a getter, no setter. So there's you can get the diameter and get the mass, but you can't set the diameter or mass. It's interesting uh, choice. Same thing with name. I can get the ma diameter, mass, and name, but I can't set it. Where does this get set? It gets set inside the constructor method. The constructor method sets those uh, parameters, so you don't have to do it again in your um, using your properties. Okay, so those are all your properties. Um, you also, we also have, if you notice, I've, oh, I've overridden the two-string method. We talked about that last week, too. 
how I can take a built-in method, an inherited method that I get from the object superclass, and I can override it so it can make it ours or make it our own, right? And that's what I've done here with the two-string method for the planet, right? Okay, so now we're going to have our abstract planet class, a blueprint for other classes, and then we're going to have two subclasses, a giant planet, right? Usually we call them gas giants, right? Gaseous, uh, like, for example, uh, Jupiter and uh, Saturn are two examples in our solar system. Um, and, and they have, there's also a, a terrestrial planet. Terrestrial planets are like the Earth, Mars, Mercury, and so on, right? Some of those, those, those kind of planets, right? So terrestrial planets, I could have put here another one, if I really wanted to, dwarf planet, right? Like Pluto, right? Pluto used to be a real planet, now it's just a dwarf planet. You know how it is. They dropped Pluto. We lost Pluto over the last, uh, you know, little while. When I grew up, Pluto was a planet, right? Now it's not a planet anymore. It's a dwarf planet, right? Anyways, but that's, that's how NASA goes. And there's another one, Ceres, that's inside the, um, uh, the asteroid belt. So there's different kinds of, of planets. but uh, So these are more concrete classes because I want you to instantiate objects of these two classes, of giant planet and terrestrial planet. And each of these has something called interfaces, which we're going to talk about today. There's two interfaces for each of them. I has moons and I has, uh, I has rings, right? Um, well, actually, the terrestrial planets also has I habitable. Um, think about, these are just the names of interfaces, and we're going to talk about interfaces. But I want you to think about interfaces almost as like this, right? I can't have, I can't inherit from more than one base class. So if I have one base class, like planet, planet is a, my abstract base class, right? I'm going to inherit from planet to create giant planet or terrestrial planet. And both these types of planets, remember we talked about before, when we use inheritance, we're specializing, we create new specialized forms of the planet uh, class called giant planet. And giant planet is bigger because it has more stuff, more features, if you will, than the regular planet uh, abstract class, right? Because planet, the abstract class, has lots of, of properties, but giant planet has more. And same thing with terrestrial planet. Right? So we can't inherit from multiple, multiple uh, classes, but what we can do is we can use interface, interfaces to further def define the shape of our classes. And we're going to talk about this today. Think about this way. I want to have, I want to ensure, I want to enforce some rules on my, on my subclasses. And that's why I'm using these interfaces. Interfaces can help us structure what the subclasses will look like. So, for example, my I has moons interface, we're going to talk about what this is in a second. It's another blueprint that basically says this. If I in implement my I has moons interface alongside of my superclass planet, right, that means that I have to, I must override my has moons method. Either I have moons or I don't have moons, right? If I, if I implement the I has moons, means chances are I have a moon, right? That's what it means, right? And that's why I've named it this way. For interfaces, I've named them I has. I stands for interface. That's usually how we do it. That's the, that's the convention. Has moons, right? So it's almost like implement the has moons method is what I'm saying. I has rings. Implement the has rings method. That's what I'm saying. Implement that method, right? I habitable. A implement the habitable method. Habitable means people can live there. The only one we know about right now is the Earth. We might, there might be, you know, still Martians. We don't know. So far, we haven't been able to tell. It takes us about 11 months to get out there, right? Uh, you know, at top speed. And we're talking about, like, you know, if we were to go something like Mach 10, right, in space somehow, right, which is kind of crazy. But um, round trip, by the time we accelerate, you know, get to the midpoint, slow down, our average speed is going to be the point where it takes about 11 months for us to get around the planet. And then there's some kind of operations where we're going to get from, you know, uh, the orbit of, the, of Mars to the planet and somehow escape from the planet back to the orbit. It's really crazy. Um, I don't know about you, but being an astronaut these days is still not really worth it. <laughs> it. Takes too long, right? And you know, you spend a lot of time in space on your own, right? Which is crazy. One day when we can go like 0.2 light, then you know we're going to be fine, right? But for now, like it's going to take us 11 months. Hey, by the way, just just curious, the size on the side. For since we're talking about planets and stars and all this kind of stuff, right? What's the speed of light in a vacuum? Anybody remember? And kilometers per second. Come on, you guys should. You guys are science fiction people. How much? No. <laughs> Anybody? 300,000 kilometers per second, right? So the speed of light travels 300,000 kilometers per second. 
the, st the sun compared to us, you know, it's 150 million kilometers away from us. So if, it's, if it light travels 300,000 kilometers per second, how many seconds does it take for the sun to come up, for the sun's light to come to, to hit us in the morning? Eight minutes, right? Because it takes about eight light minutes. So the sun is eight light minutes away, right? It's kind of interesting. Um, anyway, so now you got to figure that Mars is about 78 million kilometers away from us, right? So it's going to actually be, it's actually closer than the sun, right? Then the sun's quite far away. But by the time we can get there, it still takes us 11 months. Best case, right? With our current propulsion systems and, you know, fuel cells and all that kind of stuff. Anyways, just, you know, not an amateur astronomer or anything like that, but I, you know, I do, do know a little bit about space. Okay, so, so when you implement this stuff, you need a driver class like we did before. You need this program class. The program class is going to basically implement two types of planets, a giant planet and a terrestrial planet, and I want you to call the two-string method from the planet superclass right, in, for both the giant planet and the terrestrial planet. That's the assignment in a nutshell, right? There's one other method that I want you to implement in the program class because so far we've been running without debugging, run without debugging. And I want to be able to wait for a key. So I want you to, you know, create a method, wait for key, and when, what, what happens is when I call these, when I run my, my code, I want to be able to call my wait for any key method so that way my, my, uh, uh, my terminal window doesn't go goodbye. I don't want that to happen. I want to kind of sit there and waiting until, you know, until someone use, press the button. Okay, so we'll talk about these kind of things. The details, of course, are down here. Um, and this is what your test is going to look like. It won't be so detailed. I probably won't ask you to do as much, right? I'll be honest with you. It's, there's just so much in here, right? But some of the same stuff will be there. Like, for example, you know, put together a private instance variable for diameter mass. Uh, moon count and so on. You can see that I've even telling you the types, right? Um, public properties, the diameter, read only, mass, read only, moon count, name, you know, and so on. All these kind of things is what I want you to uh, to implement for each of the each of the uh, objects. And this is just for your uh, abstract clan, uh, class planet that we're we're going to create, right? Same thing with giant planet and terrestrial planet. Um, those two uh, those two things. They gives details about what I'm looking for, right? And um, I'm looking for uh, a few interfaces too. There's three interfaces I want you to implement, right? It'll include a method header, has moons that returns a bool data type, right? And so on. We're going to talk about interfaces today. So if you don't know what those are, don't worry about it right now. But there's a few interfaces. Then your main method of your driver class will be structured as follows. Here's the stuff. And there's your program structure, what it's going to be asking you to do. Same as you've seen before. Um, internal documentation, of course, worth six marks. Please don't forget to do that. People still do that. They don't put any internal documentation, and they lose six marks off their off their code. That's like ten percent here, um, which is nuts. And um, and they don't share it on GitHub. They just give me I don't know some kind of their, their zip files. Sorry, I couldn't make GitHub work. So here's my zip files, and I didn't put any internal documentation. That's ten marks off. Ten marks. That's crazy. Ten marks out of sixty-eight, right? That's a big sacrifice. It's like you know twenty percent gone. So you can maximum you can get it at eighty percent now, right? Remember the way I'm going to mark it is exactly how the rubric looks like. So. I'm going to look at the marks and say, how many marks for functionality did he or she get? I don't know, this many marks. OK, did they do the program structure piece? Yes. OK, how many marks? Internal documentation, did they do it? Yes, six marks. Version control, yes, four marks. And then you get your 68. That's it. There's no, and what about bonus marks? What about if you add like testing classes and stuff like that? Well, I'll give you bonus marks for that. Or you add extra features. You make your interface look really beautiful or whatever. I'll give you bonus marks for that too. Right? It's all up to you. I mean, the stuff I'm telling you to do is the bare minimum. What if you want to implement it something else? Like you, you know, you made terrestrial planet, you've made a giant planet, but you also want to make dwarf planet. I didn't ask you for dwarf planet, but you made it anyway. Am I going to be mad at you? Oh my God, I didn't ask you for dwarf planet. Get out of my class, right? You know, it's not, not going to happen. I'm going to go, wow, hey, congratulations. You made a dwarf planet. You actually extended what I asked you to do. I'll probably give you a bit of a bonus for that. Don't go too crazy, right? Don't like, don't spend like 60 hours doing this thing. It's not a 60 hour project, but you know, um, if you want to practice, the assignments are there for you to practice with and extend them and do more than I've asked you to do. You get a chance to make get bonus marks. I'm going to give you extra stuff. And it also might make up, make up for some of the stuff you missed. <laughs> you added some extra stuff over here, you know, and then maybe you didn't do so much so well over here, and then, you know, it kind of balances off. I always try and award effort is what I'm saying. So questions around this assignment three. It's nothing different than you've seen. One thing that I have included for your viewing pleasure only, don't tell anybody, okay, but is this, <laughs> is the diagram, you know, 
just so don't be mad because I've included the diagram. I know people, they're like, Tom, it's too easy. You're like, you tell, sometimes you look at me, you're like, Tom, I don't understand. It's so easy. People don't. What was that? Just to that way, I'll give them without that. But no, he might like, look at me like, Tom, I don't understand. It's too easy. But then people don't get it done anyway. <laughs> right? That's what I'm trying to do. So it's like, it's bizarre, right? So take the diagram and run with it, guys and girls. Okay? It's not like it's, it's not a bad thing. And you're going to get this in the real world or something like it. Okay. Let's talk about interfaces because we've been talking a lot about this stuff and assignments and what it's going to look like on your test next week. It's going to look like that. Just less requirements. Okay? Yeah. There will be some. There will be some. It won't be as much. Like, I won't, I mean, again, it's a time limit, right? So for me, the reason why I don't like tests at all, period, actually, well, there was a time when I used to first teach, I didn't do tests at all. I said, test doesn't make any sense, right? Um, I've changed my mind. Uh, over the course of time only because people cheat, right? <laughs> so you got to be able to give some individual work. Otherwise, you can't really know who's doing what. Um, and people pay for their assignments to be done by somebody else and all that stuff. We all know about these things, right? So, you know, that's what tests are for. Tests are there to prove that you know how to how to do this stuff uh, within a time frame. You know, it's, it's uh, you know, I'm going to try and make it fair so it's not too much. I'm not going to try and make you do like three hours work of, worth of work in an hour and a half. That doesn't make any sense. Um, some people make it so that you can never finish the test. There are some professors that write a test so it's impossible to finish unless you're awesome. I don't write it that way. I usually write it for about an hour and a half. Some people still won't finish, right? They still go to like the ex, you know, to the two-hour mark or whatever. Some people will will finish in an hour, right? So you know, this is the way it is. So we'll see how it goes. Okay. Um, so I want to go back to that. Uh, if I go back to inheritance, this is back from week four. The, I'm looking at the PowerPoint from week four called inheritance. Now, inheritance uh, in the book, and this is going back, I think it's chapter 10, I think in the book or something like that. Yeah, it's chapter 10. Um, and the book that we're using here. Chapter 10 is not just about inheritance, but also about polymorphism. So it's kind of really weird that they kind of did that. I mean, usually I'm using the chapters being broken up into different sections. One chapter for polymorphism, another one for inheritance. Um, this, there's 68 slides in this one. And as we go down here, we talked about overriding base class methods last time. We did that with the two-string method. And we need to use the override keyword, right? So the override keyword, let's go back into that for a second to go where we left off last time. Object class, here we go. Da, 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 da. Here we go. We overrode the two-string method. So we kind of said, hey, let's take the two-string method and override it, and we use something else, we use something else differently last time. We're going to go back into the code called string.format. We use the string.format method to send a string back to the two string method. Two string method is actually the most overridden method of the object superclass, right? So this is how you do it public override. Again, you need to use the override keyword. And then what it does is it takes this method and overrides it. But how do you set up an overridable method? Now, there are some languages, like Visual Basic as an example, that you, need, you have to say, overridable. <laughs> this one you can override, right? But a lot of times it's enough to say it's abstract. OK, we'll talk about that in a second. I'm not going to talk about the equals method um, so far. We're going to talk about that later. I get hash code. Again, it's just a unique code for each of your, uh, of your objects and so on. We need to do that right now. Uh, base, ca base class constructors have been doing that from the very first moment we've been doing this kind of stuff. Um, and we just finished off talking about this abstract class again, idea. And again, the difference, the, 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 the um, things to understand here is that you cannot instantiate or create concrete objects from an abstract class. Only concrete classes can create concrete objects. When I mean concrete, I mean objects that you can use, right? Abstract classes can't create objects from them. They're just there as blueprints. I'm, I'm kind of, you know, repeating myself so you get it. Because some people, whatever reason, I'll put an abstract class on the test, and they'll be like, Tom, I don't know why, but I can't create a method. For, uh, I can't create an object from this class. Oh, well. I can't tell you on the test why, right? But you should know that you can't know. Of course not. They're just, they're just uh, blueprints. So this is an example. And we talked about this, actually. We said, hey, what if you had an animal superclass, right? Here's an animal superclass. Animal doesn't mean anything from a con contextual perspective. Right, there's no context for animal. Um, you know, it has, maybe has a name, as an example, right? And there's the public um, read-only getter uh, property, if you will, for this one. Now it has take a look, take a look at this a public abstract speak method, but there's no body. 
So when I do this, when I create abstract, when I put abstract in front of a method like this, and I have a semicolon, so there's no curly braces where I put some, some code block, what I'm basically saying is you must override this method. This method here, which is the public abstract string speak method with no body, you must override in any class that inherits from the animal superclass. The animal superclass that's abstract, right? And going back to the definition of abstract class, it says, usually contains abstract methods, although methods are not required. An abstract method has no method statements, and derived classes must override. It means you have no choice. You cannot implement a, a um, you can't inherit from a, a, a superclass that has abstract methods and not use them. You have to use them. Actually, there's really good cases like that in both if you're programming in Android and using Java. Uh, or even in iOS, there's certain methods when we program mobile devices that you must override. And there's some methods that you choose to override. If you want to, you can. If you don't want to, it's optional, right? OK, so that's the one thing we have to kind of talk about there. OK, so here's an example of this. So here's my class dog, right? And it's inheriting from the animal abstract superclass is abstract. Notice that we must override the speak method because we've, we've um, uh, you know, kind of marked it as abstract inside the animal superclass. And you're going to say, hold on a second. Why would I make a method that has no body, right? Why would I do that? The same reason why we make interfaces. We're going to see in a second. Because I wanted to, to kind of define the shape of my class. You know, I want to say something like this. All game objects in my game system have to have a start method, right? And they have to have some kind of um, other method, like a, an update. They must have an update method, and they need to have a start method. Let's just say my game class, right? Now, you can, use, you can leave them empty, but they have to have those methods because that, that's what makes them a game object. I want to define the, 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 you know, the minimum um, requirements to define an object of the type that I'm thinking about. It's not really for you to use. It's for when you pass it on to somebody else. Or if you're using a class that's been defined by somebody else, they'll have requirements. You have to have these things. And one of the things we have to have here in the abstract animal class is the speak method. And the speak method must be overridden, even if it's empty inside. You still need to put it inside your subclasses. And an example of this would be your dog class. I override the speak method, and now I return woof, because that's the, what the dog says, right? And here's the cat class, right? Same as the dog class, but now the, when we override the speak method, it says meow because it's a cat, right? Notice that we use the override keyword in both instances, right? Both times for the, and they're both animals. They have an is a relationship with, a, with, an, with the animal superclass. But the only way they're related is that that's their, that's their parent. The parent class, if you will, or the, the superclass is called dog, or sorry, animal. But cat and dog have very little in relation other than that. Why? Because they're, they're unique uh, classes of their own, right? And they're bigger. Both classes are bigger, larger than their superclass parent, all right? The, always the parent or the superclass is smaller than the classes that inherit from it. OK. So here's an example of the driver class in main, right? Um, and what we're doing here is we're creating it two, an two animals. They're both animals, right? I can still say they're animals because they have an is a relationship with the animal superclass. But they're different types of animals. One is a dog, the other one's a cat. We have two unique identifiers for those things, spot and puff. <laughs> spot, we use the new keyword to instantiate. We're using constructor notation here. And we're passing in the name of the, of the animal into the constructor. Notice. If I go back to my, my superclass, right? I have, um, do I have a constructor for the superclass? Yes, it's called animal. And animal, the constructor takes in a name. It's required. And basically what it does is it takes the, uh, the private instance variable name and assigns it the value of name. Now remember what I do is I usually use the uh, public property here. So I never use the instance variable directly other than in the property itself, okay? That's just me. But I also make both um, read and write type properties. What if this, this one's only a read-only property, so I can't use the property here to assign a value. I can only get the value. And that's why they're doing it directly here in the constructor. Right? So they're accessing the private name value here, name, name data here, right? 
and I'm taking the local variable that I'm, that's incoming into the constructor called the same name, name, the same identifier name, name, and I'm taking this name, like from the from the constructor, and assigning it to this dot name, which is really all around the private instance variable name that's contained up here. Even though they have the same identifier name, there are two different variables. One belongs to the class. The other one is incoming into the constructor and is only a local variable inside that constructor method. It doesn't exist anywhere else. OK. Let's keep going. So, so then when I go here, I'm actually using the constructor from the super class that I've inherited into my, uh, into my dog and cat classes, right? So when I uh, console write line spot.name says, and then spot speak, right? Puff speak and spot speak, the speak uh, method doesn't come from, originally come from the dog or cat classes, it comes from the animal super class. But we override it in the dog and cat classes in order for us to use it. If it's not overridden, right, then uh, C Sharp, the compiler would give us an error saying, you must override this abstract method that's been defined in your super class. It'll give you an error. We're gonna try it in a second, right? Okay. So. So this is some of the reasons why you know we uh, we do that. We have this you know these abstract classes uh, where we have you know these methods. And and I hear what they've done is they've created a, a public static method to actually output. Notice that when we pass in the dog and cat into this local method that's part of the driver class, we're listing for animals, not for a dog or a cat. But we can do that because dogs and cats are both animals. They're, they have an is a relationship with the animal superclass. So therefore, this is true. But we don't know what type of animal it is. We don't know if it's a dog or a cat. This is a great example of, of polymorphism here, right? We're getting a cat or a dog. We don't know which one it is. You know, we're, we're getting in here. And then what we're, what we're going to do is creature name says creature speak. We don't know what the creature is going to be. But we know that all creatures, all animals, have the speak method, right? We don't know what animal. was a dog or a cat. But they're going to both speak. They're going to speak their own language. Right? So actually, it's inheritance, not polymorphism. All right. Um, so the idea to have multiple inheritance, this is where we're coming into interfaces. We cannot, we do not accept multiple inheritance in most programming languages that use object-oriented programming. OK? Most. There's a couple that we can. Um, but it's prohibited in C Sharp, which means we don't have multiple inheritance. What does that mean? That means I can't have two parents, unfortunately, in C Sharp. We only have one, right? Um, so there's only a superclass, one superclass. You can't have two, right? And the reason for this would be, how would you figure out, and then some people, some languages have done this, how would you figure out what methods the subclass gets? If I have some in the one and some in the other, do they get all of them, right? Like, how, what's the, what are the rules? Do they only get the ones that intersect, the ones that are the same? Well, that would make the subclasses smaller, actually, not bigger, right? So that's, they would have to get bigger. So chances are we're using the same rules then if I have a parent class A and parent class B, if this, if this was possible, by the way, it's not. But let's say we did. Then this, this, the child class would be really big, right? It would have all the stuff from both parent classes. That's nice. But what if the parent classes had similar methods? What if they were called method A was in, in parent class A and method A was also in parent class B? Which one do I take, right? Do I take them both? Are, they, are, they, um, are those two methods um, um, you know, overloaded methods? You know, for example, there's lots of problems that can happen, that can occur, and it causes complexity. And that's why C Sharp and Java and a lot of other languages avoid multiple inheritance. Also, we talked about this before. I want you to think inheritance is like a big domino effect, right? So if I do something in my super class, every, every other class that inherits from it gets affected. So imagine if I have two super classes now. If I do something in one or the other, then a bunch of other stuff happens, and it's a pyramid effect, right? And we want to try and avoid inheritance as much as possible. Like, inheritance is bad, actually. It's not good, right? We want to use inheritance when it makes sense, right? But we don't want to use inheritance all the time uh, just for you know, the, the sake of using it. We want to be able to use something called um, composition, class composition, which is what we did with the, the deck class. Now, I know some people say the deck class, kind of still playing with that whole idea, the deck class or the, uh, or the card class. But the deck, the idea of what we did last week with the deck card and the card class is something we, we call you know, class composition, where we take objects that we've created in other classes and create them as properties in, in, in you know, the class I'm using right now. That's more powerful than inheritance because I'm not inheriting from card you know, when I'm creating a deck 
you know, kind of thing. Not really. I'm not inheriting, you know, um, the, in the same way. I'm using the, you know, objects of those classes. Okay. So when I create um, an interface then, <clears throat> interfaces are the only way we can use, you know, almost like the idea of multiple inheritance. It gives us another feature of a class, right? So I created uh, an interface like, for example, iWorkable, right? Notice that it has the I in front of it, like I said. I is just a, is a, a convenience or a, um, you know, a best practice, if you will. Right, that we say when we put the guy in front of the name of the class, it means that it's like a class, but it's this object, this interface is an interface. If I put the I, means interface. And what does interfaces do? They define a method. Here's the method, work, right? And it says an abstract class. In an abstract class, not all methods need to be abstract. In an interface, all methods are abstract. That means if I inherit, or if I implement, that's what we call. We use we use the word implement. We use the word extends when we when we make a uh, subclass. So I take a class like planet, giant planet. Then would extend the planet abstract class. We use the word extends when we talk about things in vocabulary. If I'm talking to another developer and I say, I'm going to extend this class and create my subclass, they should understand what it means. The, the words extend, right? Or derive would be the other way of saying. It. I'm going to derive a new class from my my you know my base class. Okay. Um, but when I say interface, when I'm talking about interface, I, I want to talk about implementing. I want to implement the interface, OK? So this is just the vocabulary we're going to use. If you go to work and you use these, you might use the same words that I'm using here, OK? I'm talking about I'm going to implement an interface. I'm going to extend a super, uh, a super class into a base class or, uh, sorry, into a, into a child class and so on, right? Those are the kind of words we want to use. Now, they can be intimidating and new at the beginning. But don't be intimidated by it. It's just words, right? It's just words to describe what the activities that we're doing. So when we implement a interface, what we need to do is any methods that are defined inside the interface, like this one here, work, has to be overridden in any class that, that is implementing this interface. OK, so why would I do it? <laughs> the question is always going to be, but why? Why am I using interfaces? It doesn't make any sense. I don't have to use interfaces. You're right, you don't. But what it does is it restructures or creates another shape for our class, other features that we must do. And the reason why is, for example, you know, if Tatiana, she's made a class, and I want to use it as an example, right? But she, her, she's made a class in a specific way and says, you know, these are the features of my class, and I'm also going to give you some options, but they need to be overridden, right? For example, work. Define that you're telling me you need to define. I'm going to give you this class, but you need to define the work method. You have to define it in order for you to use my class, whatever that class is going to be called. It's almost like I'm structuring the the, the I'm, I'm creating a structure for all subclasses. All right. So I want you to think about this. Now you can have you can have your interfaces attached to abstract classes, and you can have interfaces attached to concrete classes. All right. So you don't have to have interfaces just attached to concrete classes, to subclasses. They can also be attached to superclasses. But that means if I have an interface that an abstract class implements, that means all of its subclasses must implement that class as well, the interface. It's automatic. OK, just FYI, that's how it works. This is where it gets complex. All right, so here's an example of this, right? So I've got my employee class. I use the iWorkable interface. Right, I it looks I, I still put it uh, beside the colon, right? So colon I workable. You know, at the beginning you'd say it's a class. No, it's not because you have the I in front of it. That's what's going to tell you it's an interface. All right, seriously, it's just conventions. So what am I doing? I must override my work method. I must write it in. Notice how I put it in there. Right. Same thing with my animal. Animal I workable. I must have the work. It's not. It's cut off here. But I must have the abstract. Uh, work uh, method that's inside my my class. Right, that's what that's what interfaces do. And here it is. You can see that this is public override string work. I'm overriding my uh, the um, uh, the work method because I'm implementing in my animal class. Right. Here's my animal super class. I'm implementing the I workable interface. That's what I said. You can be both concrete classes like employee, right or in this particular case, it's not, it's not saying, it's not an abstract class. This 
animal as an abstract class. So both concrete classes and abstract classes can implement interfaces, right? And then anything that's derived from those classes, like for example, dog and cat are subclasses of the animal class, you must override their work methods because the work method must be there inside my animal, my dog uh, sub and cat subclasses because the animal superclass implements them. Phew. I just still want you, don't be confused. I want you, we're going to do some examples on the board here. But I want you to think about um, these as additional parameters, if you will, additional, you know, requirements to create classes with. So someone gives you an interface and says, you must implement this interface, Tom, right? That means that I have to use the methods, I have to implement the methods that are part of that interface. Okay, I'm saying the same things over and over again. Hopefully you'll get it. Okay. Um, so again, it says you cannot instantiate concrete objects from either abstract classes or interfaces. This is important to know. So I can't make, I can't inherit or create, they use the new keyword within an interface. I can't do that, right? Um, and again, another thing to, know, to note is just, this is just a summary. A class can inherit from only one base class, only one parent class. I don't, multiple inheritance is a no-no. It doesn't go with C Sharp, Java, JavaScript, um, Python, and so on. Lots of classes. Swift, you know, all the new classes, all the new uh, li uh, languages out there. There are some that, uh, that allow multiple inheritance, okay? Um, and it says here you can create an interface when you, when you want derived classes to override every method. So if I want my derived class or my child class to, to override a, spe a specific method, then I use an interface for that. I'm forcing my, my, my user at the, at the other end. So again, t the ex ex your example of Titania is creating this, this amazing class that she made, right? I don't want to use it. She's created an API a programming interface, and I want to use her methods and classes, but she's got some interfaces that I need to implement in order for me to use those classes. I must override the methods that are detailed in those interfaces. Okay. Um, I'm just going to keep going here for extension methods. So I think we've talked about what interfaces are. I'm not going to go, extension methods are kind of, um, it's like a method, but they're a little different. Give me a second. Make sure I capture all this stuff. Yeah, we're not going to talk about UI applications. So that's really it. Let's let's do some examples of of interfaces because this is kind of the end of polymorphism and inheritance and everything else this week. So all we're going to do this week is you're know, we talking about interfaces. Interfaces. I'm going to interface you guys to death, right? <laughs> so that you guys like know everything about interfaces, right? Which is really important to know. Okay, so let's try this out. So one is first. Let's take a look at our assignment again. If I was going to look at my map. Here's assignment, no, this is number two. If I was to look at assignment three, here's assignment three. Oh, it was already open. If you see assignment three as an example, and you see this, see this little pit, this little mark like this? This means that giant planet has two interfaces that it's implementing. I has moons and I has rings, right? The I has moons and I has rings interfaces define two methods, right? Has moons. Look, and has rings. It tells you what to do, right? You need to implement these two methods. But you need to define these two interfaces, right? Same thing with um, ha I habitable. I habitable, a habitable means that you have to use the habitable method. Must override the habitable method because I'm implementing these two interfaces. Again, all I'm doing with this one is I'm creating additional requirements for your, for, uh, for your class structure, the way your class is going to be shaped how it's going to look compared to other classes. Yes. Love it. That's a great way of talking about it. Almost like additional business rules for each class, yes. Or additional requirements, you can say, you know, for the, for the shape of the classes to make them more realistic or apply them better to the real world, okay? But there's so, sometimes what we want to do with those is we want to leave them less defined. We don't want to define the method body because each subclass is going to define it slightly differently. So there's no, me there's no reason for us to define it if it's just going to be, be overridden. That's what we're talking. So we make it abstract. So would it be like, like in a class or in, in its own class? Like it depends. Like, for example, I can't do that because in the planet class, in this case, um, if some of them might have rings and moons and other ones won't. 
right? So, for example, one of them has an I habitable. Not all of them are habitable. Gas plant, gi gas giants typically are not habitable, and therefore they wouldn't implement the, the uh, I habitable interface, right? So I couldn't put it in my superclass in this case. Not, not that I couldn't put uh, I has moons, because I has moons looks like both of them have moons. But what about a dwarf planet? Does dwarf planet, do dwarf planets have moons too? Don't know. You have to look that up, right? Just curious, since you're asking, right? <laughs> dwarf planets, right? Dwarf planets have moons, right? Maybe they do, maybe they don't. I don't know, right? Here we go, Ceres. Right? No. Uh, and they talked about dwarf planets here, but you can see that there's a few dwarf planet, planets they've, they've uh, mentioned right now. Um, Ceres and Pluto, the diameter relative to the moon. Like, look, the Pluto is like not even the size of the moon. And that's why they called it a kind of a dwarf planet, I guess. So small, right? Mm -hmm. Sirius is even smaller than that, but it's a large asteroid in our asteroid belt. Okay, so let's implement this stuff. I'm going to go here into Visual Studio. This is the time when we actually do, not watch. First, I got to explain stuff. I apologize. I know that I, you know, we we talk a lot about philosophy. Here's a philosophy of how to do this stuff. You know, the the uh, you know the idea behind it. And now let's do it, right? I want to kick off a new project here, a little bit different than we've done before. So I'm going to go File New Project. We're going to make it a C Sharp project, a console application, and we're going to make this console application. We're going to call it uh, <clears throat> the player. Go back to player idea. All right. So here's my player uh, project. We call it the player project, and uh, I'm going to click OK. Here's my the player project is the namespace. My program is the driver class, right? And what I want to do is I want to have two classes. I want to have a super class, right, called my game object, right? That's what I want to do. And I want to have two subclasses. One is the player, and the other one is the enemy, OK? I want you to do this while we're in class. And I want you to help me make it with the drawing tools we have at our, at our disposal, right? Why not? We can also do it by hand, if you like. But first, the first thing I'm going to do, just to, just to keep us on track, is I'm going to create a new repository up on GitHub. I'm going to use the Visual Studio tools. I'm going to go here to GitHub to do it. So I'm not going to you know, do it by hand or even separately. I'm going to click on Centennial College. And I'm going to call this thing uh, comp123 uh, summer 2016. And it's going to be lesson, lesson six. OK? So that's where the. That's where it's going to appear up on GitHub. Notice I'm doing it all in Visual Studio with the GitHub extension for Visual Studio 2015. I'm going to click Publish. Once I do this, it'll create a brand new repository up online, right? All right, let's do a couple of things here. So I, what I want to do, going back to the Solution Explorer here, right? I'm going to add in a new item in my project. I'm going to right, right click. I'm going to go Add New Item. Remember, we did this last time. I want to create a diagram. So I'm going to search for diagram. Right? Class diagram is what I want. Here it is. And I want to make it a class diagram from my player project. So I'm going to just make it really long. So player, player project, class diagram. Gee, hmm, if you were going to do assignment number three, what would, I'm asking, what would I get you to do? Model it first. Different kind of way of doing it. There's different approaches, right? I can use the model first approach that I'm using here. So I'm modeling it first, drawing it out, and then you know, I can create my code afterwards. Or I can use the code first approach, which is the other way we've been doing, which is code it first, right? And then create the model after. It's kind of backwards to me, right? First I model it, draw it out first, think about it, and then code it. Makes more sense, right? Which is almost like a planning piece. So let me just add this in. Now my, my class diagram comes empty. So I need two classes, right? I, I'm sorry, three classes. One of them is going to be abstract, which is going to be the object, the game object superclass, right? That's what's going to be an abstract game object superclass. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, mirror this up. Let's try this out. So I want to right click here and add a new class. Now look, this class or abstract class. Abstract class is the one I want. Cancel that one. Abstract class is the one I want, right? Okay, here we go. So I know it's an abstract class, and I want to call it. Game object. So I'm making a game, right? I'm making a game for Unity, let's say. And I want to make my own game object superclass. 
How am I going to do it? This is the way you do it. Access is public. I can also choose internal or default. There's no need for those. Public is enough. Here's the game object class, what it's going to be called. Create new file, right? I could also add it to an existing file. Don't recommend, right? But you could if you really wanted to. It'll just append it to the end of the file. OK, and then press OK. So there's my game object. Let's define all these first, all right? So before I even do any piece of code, I want to do this kind of stuff, right? OK, that's the first thing I want to put. Here's my diagram. Second diagram, I want to right click. I want to add a new class. It's not, now this is a concrete class I'm adding. And we're going to do a new, a new concrete class that we're going to call player. So here's my player, right? And we're going to make this player class. Here it is. Don't worry about the lines yet. And we're going to do another one, a new class. So we're going to call we're going to call this enemy, All right? I want you guys to brainstorm here a little bit. Enemies and players are very similar, right? In that they both have certain things that they can do. They can move, right? They can fight. Um, you know, as an example, they can jump. They can do different things. All that stuff that's common should be in the game abstract class. Everything that's common to both thing both classes should be in the game object superclass. That's abstract. Anything that's unique between the player and the enemy, right, as an example, should, should have something else that, you know, that's different from, you know, uh, from one to the other, OK? You also got to think about some things that are unique to the player and unique to the enemy. I want you guys to start thinking with me. We'll, do it, we'll build it together that we can I implement as opposed to, that doesn't really belong in the game object superclass, all right? So this is going to be a longer example we're going to work with today and next day. All right, and it's important for us to build this up because I want to make it as realistic as possible. Okay, so in our game object, we know that our player and our enemy derive themselves from the from the game object. Remember what you can do with the tools. If I go to my toolbox, right? Let me just pin this up for a second. I can click the inheritance uh, arrow here. So I'm going to click onto that, and what I can do is draw from one class to the other. So I, I draw from my player class, and I inherit from game object. And I draw from my enemy class to game object, and I draw that too. Right? So now I, I know that my enemy and my player are inherited from game object. Yeah, those are the two things. All right, we're going to do interfaces later. But for now, those are the first two things we have to do. Right? So these just basic structure. All right, let's talk about some features of my player and uh, both player and enemy. I think both player and enemy would have some kind of health points, right? So health points definitely would have some kind of health or you know whatever lives. Call them whatever you like. Let's call them lives for now because let's we're gonna make a very small two D game. All right. So they have lives. So right click. I'm gonna add a new uh, a new property. Now I can do two things. I can make the property or I can make a uh, a property or a field. Right now, for now, for me, I'm going to make a property called lives. Right? Here's my property called lives. We're going to make the field later. Right? So this is called lives. Okay. What else does a, a player have? All players have lives, and so do the enemies. Uh, the enemies might only have one life, right? But still have lives, right? Um, um, let me let me talk about this. Also, from a lives perspective, they can move. Right? They have the ability to think to do things like. Move left, move right. Yes. What else? So the Think about capabilities. Like, yeah, things like um, I can. I have might have a move method, right? A move method, and so on. Uh, one thing for sure, I have a property. Each player will have its own name, right? So let's say, for example, um, and so were the enemies. There might be different types of enemies, different named enemies. Like, for example, red enemy or blue enemy or green enemy, right? Those could be the name of the enemy. And some kind of an identifier or a type, if you will, right? There can't be different player types. There's really only one type that I can think of. I'm thinking about, by the way, a single player game. Okay, please don't think about multiplayer games because then it could be single player, multiplayer. That's not what I mean. But let's just think about a game that there's only one player, all right? And there's a bunch of enemies. All right, so let's uh, you know, let's add a couple of other things. So we add another property, we'll call this property name. So all players and, uh, and enemies have names. OK? They have lives and names. Um, OK, what other things? They also have methods. They have a couple methods. One of them would be you know, the move method. I can move. And we're going to keep it simple, OK? I don't want, we can also we can break it down and say move left, move right, jump. These are all methods they could have. If you really want to put those in, we'll do it. All right? Let's do that now, actually. 
So I'll say, uh, here's one method. We'll call this move right. And move right. And we'll do another method, again, called move left. Right? So players can move right, left, and right. Enemies can move left and right. How about this? Can players move forward and back in a 2D game, or even in a 3D game? Yeah, they could. Right? So we'll say add method, move forward, add method, move back. In a 3D game, they would also move, move up and move down, right? Because you can go up and down across the z-axis. Or if you're playing in a Unity environment, it'd be across the y-axis, right? What do I mean by this, by the way? For those people who are truly interested in this kind of stuff, I, I invite you to look at something like a Blender. Well, if you really want to do that, let me just bring that up really quickly. Again, this is a bit of an aside, but I want you to understand what I'm talking about here. I'm using Blender 2.77. This is just a, a piece of freeware that you can download. Actually, it's uh, open source. Right? So if you look at Blender here, I'm, I'm in a three-dimensional environment. Right? The red arrow represents the x-axis, the green arrow represents the y-axis, and the z arrow represents the, or the blue arrow represents the z-axis. Right? Now really what I want to try and do is put my game in a two-dimensional perspective. Right? So I'm going to kind of change that view to show you what I'm talking about here. Just for demonstration, we don't have a UI, so that's the reason why I'm using this thing, not because I'm a, I want to play a game with you guys. Um, so what I'm going to do is, if you don't have this, it's OK, just watch. Um, what I want to do is I want to look at it from the top view. And I'm also going to limit my camera so that it is, um, I'm going to move from perspective to orthographic. OK, so now you can see that it's a top-down view. All I have is two axes, right? I have my x-axis across the red line, and the green axis um, you know, is the, is the y-axis, OK? What I can do here with Blender is I can move this up and down wherever I want. So I can transform or translate the object in, in two-dimensional space. But actually, what's happening is it's actually moving in three-dimensional space. That's what I'm really doing. <clears throat> OK. And just move it back to where it was. There it was. So what I want to do here is I can define right and left movements and forward and back movements. I'm talking about forward and back movements as opposed to up and down. Right? So the, the player is going to move forward and back across the, across the, uh, the y-axis here. That's what we're doing here. OK. So I can also turn. I can move forward and back, left and right. But I can also turn left and turn right. Yeah? Would you say so? Uh, in a two-dimensional axis, I really can't look up and down. So I, can't, I don't have any look functionality like in a, in a three-dimensional game. In a three-dimensional game, I'd be able to look up and down, um, you know, kind of to create that uh, you know, third-dimensional kind of look um, uh, perspective. But here, all I can do is look left or turn left and turn right. That's all I can do. Turn right and turn left. Enemies, we will do the same thing. So let's put those methods in. So back to, back to reality. I'm going to go to add a new method. We're going to define these methods. So um, turn left, right? And another method, turn right. Lots of methods, right? Lots of crazy methods. But this is all the stuff that players and enemies can all do, right? All right. Here's where we get some interesting stuff. At the beginning, right? My player, right, I'm going to have some, some enemies. I'm going to have some, enemy, some enemies that shoot at me, and I want to have some enemies that can't shoot at all. All they can do is touch me. All right? So when they touch me, they, they hurt me. They die too, but when they touch me, they hurt me. Right? They can't shoot at me, though. So there's some enemies that have a shootable capability. Right? They can shoot. Now I'm talking about an interface. I'm talking about something that not all enemies will be able to have, only some. If I say that, that's a great opportunity for us to create an interface to define certain types of enemies. Let me explain this. So here's my enemy, right? My player should always get the shootable interface. My player should always be able to shoot. Shoot, run away, blah, blah, whatever, I can shoot. I may not be able to do it in level one because I don't have a gun, right? But I can shoot. If I have the, if I have a, a, you know, the gun, or some kind of shoot shooting mechanism, I can do it. But enemies, sometimes they can shoot. Sometimes they just chase you and touch you. OK? This is in my game I'm making. All right? Let's add a new interface. So right click. I'm going to add a new interface type. OK, my interface is going to be called I shootable. So shoot capable, basically shootable. That's what it does. I shootable. All right, cool, cool. Here's my interface. Here's something that I want to do. I want to implement the interface. How do I do that? Can I use the inheritance line? Can I do this inheritance line with this and go boop boop? Right? Can I do this? 
and wait. Let's wait till my uh, my 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 program slows down. See what happens. Right. Still thinking if I can do this kind of thing. I already have this. Can I do this? Did you try it? No. But all of a sudden, I got this little mark here. I shootable. Look at see the little dot right here. Notice I also want to use this on the top here. You can define what level of detail you want for your stuff. Right now, we're kind of using the first level of detail. Let's leave it that way. We're going to go to the next level of detail later on. But here's my iShootable interface. This is where it is right here. Okay. So some shoot, some don't. I definitely want iShootable to be player as well. This, I just dragged a line from my interface and my inheritance line. I drew an inheritance line to there. All right. I'm going to do the same thing now. Watch. I'm going to take my inheritance line and draw from my player. I shootable. So both player and enemies can be I shootable. Hmm. But not all enemies and all players, right? Either they shoot, they have the capability, or they don't, right? What other things would they would, would I want them to have? So some of them can shoot, some of them can't, right? Um, so in this particular case, my shootable enemy, right? My shootable enemy has the has the I shootable interface. But hold on a second. I'm talking I'm talking about all enemies. Is this correct? And the answer is no. Right? If I'm thinking about business rules, only some enemies can do this and some, some enemies can't. Here's the difference between an enemy and a player. An enemy has seek behavior, seek, to seek, to find you, right? An enemy also has runaway behavior, which means enemies can have a seek method and a runaway method, <laughs> like a, a flee, if you will, flee and seek. Players don't have that. Players get controlled by, by us, right? We, don't, we, use, we have our own methods to flee and seek, right? So therefore, those are the two methods that make it different than a player. Let's do that. So I'm going to right click. I'm going to add in a couple of methods, just because I'm thinking about this now as we're doing it. One is the seek method, right? And the other one is the flee method. So flee, to run away. That's what it means. OK, flee and seek as we're, as we're defining things. But I don't know about this shootable thing. I want to get rid of it. How do I do that? Well, I double click on the, on the uh, enemy class that I've defined. <coughs> and now that you see that I have my game object super class and I have a comma and then I have my interface okay let's get rid of my interface for a second okay and let's see what happens when I save this on my diagram right, so I go back to my diagram and you can see that that little mark is gone right so it's kind of the diagram is responsive to what I do on the code and the code is responsive to what I do in the diagram they kind of relate to each other. So I can kind of model it out with the, with the diagram and then program it out with the code, right? Which is what I want to do eventually. But I want you all to start. Every time we do stuff together, I want you to start with the diagram. Start with your thinking. Here's my thinking. This is what I want to build. Then code it up, right? Code structure is not that difficult. It's just your thinking your, in your mind. We're going to do some database at the end of this course, right? As we go forward, right? We're going to continue to do stuff. And as we move towards ADO.net, we're going to use some databases. And, and next half of the semester, not after next week, we're going to start UI, right? Simple interfaces, like, for example, Windows. We're going to use some window interface we're going to build with, with C Sharp, right? We're going to get to the point where we're going to connect to a database somehow, right? When we connect with the database, we're going to model the database first. I'm going to do model first approach. I'm going to model the database out, and the model is going to define my code, right? All right. So I got my eye shootable interface. My enemy, this enemy doesn't have it. I have two types of enemies, a shooting enemy. So I have a type. What kind of type am I, a shooting enemy? Or I have an enemy that's uh, another kind of enemy, right? A non-shooting enemy, shooting and non-shooting, right? Well, here's where I can go a little nuts, right? So I'm going to go back to my enemy super, uh, subclass. And I'm going to change this from a public class to an abstract class. Bear with me while I do this. Public abstract class enemy, right? Enemy is still too generic, right? We want to have two different types of enemies. We want to have, notice that it's abstract now, but it still inherits from my game object, right? So now I can't really create an object of my enemy. I need to create objects of my subclasses, right? There's two types of enemies, a shooting enemy and a non-shooting enemy, right? A shooting and a touching, basically. So I'll make those two enemies now. So right click, add new class, Right? One is the shooting type of enemy, shooting enemy, shooting enemy. There it is. And I'm going to derive with inheritance. I'm going to take my inheritance, derive it from this. There we go. There's, there's multiple layers of inheritance now. Right? And I'm also going to make another class 
which is a touching enemy, an enemy that has to touch you to damage you, but also gets damaged in the, as a result. So a touching enemy or some kind of hand-to-hand -hand enemy, touching enemy. Here's the question for you guys and girls, right? Take the inheritance line and draw it. Can my touching enemy shoot? The answer is no, right? So that means the eye shootable interface only applies to the shooting enemy, not to the touching enemy. Let's try this out again. So if I do this, look at the difference in shape between the shooting enemy so far and the touching enemy. Here's a question. Can I touch with my shootable enemy? Can I, if my shooting enemy comes in and actually crashes into you, can it do damage to you? The answer is yes. So then I should have a eye touchable interface, right? So let's do that too. So there's eye shootable and there should be eye touchable. Here's my interface, right? So let's make a new interface. I touchable, right? And it's public. Here's my interface up here. And what I want to do is do this. Well, players can touch too. Players would also do damage to enemies, right? But they'd also get damaged. But players might have multiple lives. Enemies may only have one life. We don't know, right? So what I want to do is do inheritance. So players can both do touching and shooting. So I'm, they're sh shootable and touchable, right? But this enemy is shootable and touchable because it's a shooting type of enemy. It's more dangerous than a regular. It's almost the same as a player, right? It has other things, though. It has flee and seek. The player doesn't have that, right? Um, let's take this inheritance, and we'll also say it's also touchable, right? This one's only touchable. So if I go touchable, inheritance line, draw this one out. Okay, what do, we, what do you guys see here? Let's describe what we see before we do any kind of coding, all right, in this more complicated example. I want you to think about this because when we talk about this together, I want you all to have the same language when we speak about this, all right? So we say this. We have an abstract game object superclass, right? The player class extends the game object superclass, the abstract game object superclass, and implements both the eye shootable and eye touchable interfaces. Hear my language? That's what I want you to think about. When I say this extends or implements, I want you guys to know the difference. I'm going to test you on it next day. So Wednesday, or sorry, Friday, I'll be okay. Uh, Friday, I'm going, to I'm going to ask you. If I say extends, what do I mean? If I say implements, what do I mean? Maybe I'll make a multiple thing. Draw, multi, you know, like extends to this and, you know, implements to this. I don't know. But um, they should have an idea of what we do here, right? So my eye sh I have my eye shootable and eye touchable interfaces, right? Okay. This is where inheritance gets dangerous. I've got my game object superclass that I've defined, and I want to add more stuff to it. Can I do it still? Yeah, which means everything else down the line is going to get more stuff. That's why inheritance is dangerous. Or if I subtract something, I subtract the name, that means everything here loses the name too. Anything I have in my game object superclass is inherited by these other classes. Even though the enemy abstract subclass right, is still not going to be uh, created, it's still a blueprint, right? It still inherits from my superclass. So therefore, it has all the properties and uh, methods of my superclass. All right, we still have some stuff. One uh, property I like to know is speed, right? We should have a speed value for my uh, my game object. So let's add another property here. So we'll call it speed. Some some uh, uh, and you know what? Some enemies are going to be faster than others, right? Players can have a certain speed, right? Player has lives, a uh, name, and so on. And uh, how about other things that the player might also have, right? It can move back, move forward, move left, move right. It can't jump. I'm looking at it from a, think about our game as a top-down top down strategy kind of game. Okay, so it's not a side-scroller. It's not a side-scroller 2D game, all right? It's a top-down game where I'm looking at it from a bull's, uh, you know, bird's-eye view, right? So the camera's at the top of my, of my game, okay? I'm not looking at it from the side. It's not a perspective type of game. It's a bird's-eye view kind of game, okay? So my player can move back and right, but it can't jump because there's no need for the player to jump around, okay? So I have speed, lives, name. What else? What other things? Come on. Come on, you gamers out there. There's a couple gamers in the class, right? Huh? Strength. Okay, what is that going to do for me? What is the player? When I say strength, when you say strength, is that the amount of damage he does? Okay, but think about the player. If I, I say lives, that's how much, how much lives he has. Once he loses his lives, he's done. He's dead, right? What strength? What is the strength going to do for me, for a player? 
Strength is also, if I put it here in the game object, my enemy, and my, both my shooting enemy and my touching enemies are going to have strength too. What does strength mean? How much damage they do? When they touch? When they shoot, that's a different thing. That's like, you know, shooting, that's like bullet strength or, bu or you know, bullet damage, right? And only eye shootables get those, not everyone. Like, for example, my little eye touchable won't get a, a shooting, a bullet, right? So that way I couldn't put it up here, right? So in here, let's say, for example, I want to talk about strength, right? So I'm going to talk about, like, you know, uh, the damage you can deal, strength hand-to-hand -hand we're talking about, like when they touch each other, right? Let's do that. So I'm going to right-click, add a new property called strength. We have strength and speed, name, lives. I think that's pretty good for our, our game object right now, right? And I have my player. What's unique about my player that's different than my enemy and different than my game object superclass? What can my player do, all players, right, that my enemy can't do? Well, yes, they do because they are shootable. I, they, they share the unshootable interface. All players can touch because they can touch other objects, right? How about a score, right? Players can score, enemies cannot. Right? <coughs> so they're going to have a property, a score property. Add a property called score. Right? Enemies don't have that property because enemies can't score. Enemies are just enemies. Players can score. Right? So you see how we define the business rules. I'm going to take a short break in a second. But see, all we've done here, we haven't coded a darn thing, and all we've done is define the business rules around our game, what our game is going to look like. That's how I want you to think, right? Then we can define the code behind it to how where it all works. Like if I was going to move left to move right, move forward and move back, all that kind of stuff, right? In in reality, if I was going to make a Unity object, right? Um, Unity objects have other things too. Like for example, they have things called colliders, right? Almost like a rectangular shape that goes around the object that says, "Hey, if my collider collides with or intersects with your collider, then we have a collision." Right, so we have a almost like this collision uh, event type events as opposed to just you know um, methods and objects. Okay, two more things before we do stuff. I want to implement a constructor for my game object. So when I create a game object, I take a couple of uh, things in here. I definitely want the name of my object when I create my object. So every time I have a, have a constructor, the name of my object comes in. So I'm going to right click here. I'm going to add a constructor. Right, and my constructor for the object—it's called game object. Right. Um, once I created the em this empty constructor, all the other ones need to have a constructor in here as well. Right. Is there any abstract methods that I want to add into my game object that I must override? Right inside my player, my enemy, other than the interfaces that I have in here. Right. Well, one thing I do want to override is the toString method. I want to override the toString method in my in my game object class, so when I, I can see the stats of my player. Right? We'll do that after. Let's take a short break, and when we come back, we'll, we'll continue this example as we're creating our business rules for our, our player and enemies.